A very good morning to you all. It's um, a great pleasure to see so many of you here this morning. We're delighted uh, at this, and it's uh, my pleasure. My name is Francis Gurry, um, Director General of the World Intellectual Property Organization. It's my great pleasure to be able to introduce, uh, in fact, two of the uh, co-authors uh, of the, our Global Innovation Index. Uh, with many of you, we've spoken a lot about innovation over the course of, of uh, the last years. Uh, and its importance for economic growth. Uh, it's key as a, a means of achieving economic success in a very competitive global environment. Uh, and its uh, instrumental role in helping us address some of the major uh, social challenges that we face and political challenges, whether food security or climate change uh, or health problems. Uh, one of the things that has not been so apparent, though, over the years is how to measure the capacity of a country to innovate. Uh, and we have here the pioneers uh, of that effort, uh, which is now uh, the Global Innovation Index, and which is in its sixth year and uh, is rapidly establishing itself as the leading global reference for measuring the capacity of uh, countries to innovate. And that capacity, of course, is not evenly shared around the globe. Uh, however, it is something that can be acquired, and it's for this reason that we feel that the Global Innovation Index is extremely important, because we believe that it's paving the way uh, to better and more well-informed innovation policies around the world. It serves as a benchmark to give guidance for countries in this respect. There is a theme uh, to it this year, a particular theme, uh, on which there is some focus, which is the local dynamics of innovation. Uh, and that reflects the importance of local hubs or clusters, geographical concentrations of innovation actors uh, and uh, infrastructure that are extreme, play an extremely important role in fostering innovation. So it's a great pleasure for me now to uh, introduce, first of all, Sumitra Dutta, who is the original author from uh, in his INSEAD days uh, of uh, the index. Uh, he's now the Dean uh, and Professor of Management at the Graduate School of Management at Cornell University. And he's going to speak first, and he'll be followed by Bruno Lanvin, who is known to many of you also. Uh, and Bruno is the co-author, he's the executive director uh, of the European Competitive Initiative of INSEAD. Uh, Sumitra, please. Thank you very much, Francis, and good morning, everyone. The first half of 2013 has witnessed an economic pickup, but its scope and strength has been less than anticipated last year. Overall, economic growth has and remains uneven across emerging markets and high-income economies. While economic policy action continues to be largely focused on finding the right balance between reducing debt and supporting demand, the key question remains, where will future growth come from to drive the global economy? Where and how will future jobs be created? The importance of innovation cannot be emphasized enough in this context. Policies to promote innovation lay the foundation for future growth, productivity improvements, and better jobs. After a significant drop in 2009, countries and firms have, review, has, have resumed investing in R&D and innovation. Furthermore, according to private data sources, the gross expenditures on R&D in many top spending developed and emerging nations have been characterized by a continuously positive upward trend since 2010, with healthy growth in 2012 and 2013 as well, with countries such as Indonesia, India, Malaysia, and China leading with double-digit growth. In terms of global use of intellectual property, the recovery has so far also been swift and broad-based, after 2009, we witnessed strong growth of patent applications worldwide at rates which are significantly higher than what countries experienced before the crisis. The results of the GII this year and over the last years provide testimony to the evolving global nature of innovation today. 
the top 25 ranked countries on the GII are a mix of nations from around the world, North America, Europe, Asia, Oceania, and the Middle East. With, while high-income economies dominate the list, several new players have increased their innovation capabilities and outputs. Our GII results also provide evidence for the spiky dispersion of innovation. The top 10 in the, are the same countries as in 2012, and the same holds for the top 25. Ranking still remains strongly correlated with income levels. The spiky dispersion of innovation presents important challenges for policymakers and deserves further study. One interpretation could be that innovation success leads to an emergence of a virtuous circle once the critical threshold has been passed. A strategic issue, hence, is whether the threshold is one that most countries, especially developing countries, can hope to reach and pass with additional investment, resources, and time, or if more is needed, requiring shifts in policies and mindsets. A holistic view of innovation is aligned with the principles underlying the design of the GII framework. Five input pillars capture elements of the national economy that enable innovative activities. Institutions, human capital and research, infrastructure, market sophistication, and business sophistication. The innovation input sub-index is a simple average of these five pillar scores. Innovation outputs are the results of innovative activities within the economy. There are two output pillars, knowledge and technology outputs and creative outputs. The innovation output sub-index is a simple average of these two pillar scores. Each pillar is divided into three sub-pillars and each sub-pillar is composed of individual indicators for a total of 84 indicators. The overall GII score is a simple average of the input and output sub-indices, and the innovation efficiency ratio is the ratio of the output sub-index over the input sub-index. It shows how much innovation output a given country is getting for its inputs. The GII model helps to create an environment in which innovation factors are under continual evaluation and it provides a key tool and a rich database of detailed metrics for, re for refining innovation policies. Now, the GII is a collaborative project across Cornell University, INSEAD, and the WIPO, and we are especially thankful also to our knowledge partners in the private sector, the Confederation of Indian Industry, Booz & Co., Huawei, and DU. I shall now hand the floor to Bruno Lampha for his remarks. Merci, Sumitra. Uh, bonjour à toutes et à tous. Uh, the GII covers this year 142 countries. Uh, that means uh, about 95% of the uh, world population and almost 99% of the world GDP. So there is a claim there that indeed uh, the data accumulated through the pillars and indicators that Sumitra just described should allow us to provide interesting diagnosis about how innovation is being carried out and what can be done in various countries at various levels of development uh, to foster it and improve the efficiency of innovation investment. There are three key messages that emerge from this year's uh, GII. The first one is the confirmation that indeed innovation is a global game. It is not a game that is reserved for very advanced, very rich countries. We see success in innovation sprouting from all over the, the world. The second uh, and part of this first message is that indeed, uh, as Sumitra mentioned, the, the champions can be found in all parts of, of the world. The rankings uh, this year confirm the, uh, the first spot for Switzerland, who was already first uh, last year, so congratulations to Switzerland, followed again by Sweden, and then we have the United Kingdom, the Netherlands, the United States, completing the top five. The second message, however, coming from GII this year is that there is a persistent innovation divide. If we look at the top 10 or the top 25 this year compared to last year, they are the same. There have been switches within those groups, but the top 10 remain the same, the top 25 remain the same. Which means that there is somewhere uh, an invisible barrier 
for uh, those countries which are not part of the, the top groups and who are striving to become better innovators. This persistent divide, however, is accompanied by good news. And the good news comes from what we call the innovation learners. There are countries in all parts of the world who are making significant and rapid progress in becoming better innovators. The second message, um, uh, that's the second message, that in the game is global and it's becoming one in which progress is being seen in spite of a persistence divide. The, the third message uh, is about the uh, sub-theme or the theme of the report this year, the local dynamics of innovation. GII compares the performance of countries. It is based on data collected at the country level. Yet we know when we start working at innovation on the ground that much is happening at the sub-national or international level of innovation. And this is something which is much more difficult to measure uh, using GDP or national account data. What we see is that the, the hubs, the clusters, uh, the local endeavors to better link universities, companies, uh, which can be of small size, are not only becoming globally successful, but they're also yielding new lessons about how innovation can be carried out. We see successful uh, experiments carried out in all types of countries, emerging, developing, poorer, richer countries. And this need to be examined, looked at, and considered as possible sources of replication and scaling up across the, across the world. Last point, uh, clearly uh, the press and the media are very interested in the rankings. This creates the buzz. Uh, knowing which country is ahead, whether your neighbor are doing better than what you are doing, indeed calls for attention. It is also a good way to stimulate energies. But GII aims at being much more than a ranking of countries. It aims at being a tool for action. It aims at being a source of knowledge for the policymakers, the investors, the analysts who are interested in making this planet a more innovative place to create jobs, to create growth, to create competitiveness. And this is why the uh, uh, chapters including in, the, uh, in this year's report, uh, some coming from international organizations, some coming from, from countries, all focus on specific aspects on what can we do better on the ground to foster innovation. Uh, so these are the main points I wanted to, to highlight. We're ready to answer your questions. Just before I open the floor for questions, I wanted to mention that we also have representatives of the knowledge partners who um, participated in the elaboration of the Global Innovation Index. We have Mr. Rashid Al Tayyib from Booz and Company uh, with us, uh, Mr. Osman Sultan, the CEO of uh, Du, and Mr. Li Ying Tao, the president of Huawei Research and De Development Labs. I open the floor for questions. If you could just present yourself before asking your question, Jean Pierre. Sorry, uh, Jean-Pierre Kopp, uh, Neue Zürich Zeitung. Just wanted to ask you the, the number of um, of, uh, of um, pa patents filed, or uh, didn't matter uh, from what I see from the, the sub indices uh, for, for, for their country rankings or for your uh, calculations. The number of patents filed do matter, and in fact, this time we look at also the number of patents filed in different countries. you just tell me where it would uh, where it will show in uh, is in the output side or in the input side on the table? Uh, this is this is on the output side so if you look at the knowledge creation yes you will see out there uh, it would be part of the uh, knowledge creation right Yes, Boris Engelson, a local freelancer. Uh, I have not read, analyzed, and digested this report yet. I am a little bit started uh, with the efficiency ratio ranking. Can you comment on that? Uh, then I have another two questions. So the efficiency ratio is defined as the output score divided by the input score. And it's really 
a simple way to look at it is how capable is a country in transforming its input conditions into innovative outputs. And it's an interesting ratio because it is not directly linked to income level per se. At the same time, we do recommend looking at the innovation efficiency rankings aligned with the income level of the country because at different income levels, you have different levels of input and output scores. Yes, but if you, if you look at the individual countries which are at the top of the list, uh, in most cases, uh, innovation just means that they still do exist the following day. If you have Mali number one, it requires some comments. I do not want to demean the innovative capacity of Mali. I just want a comment. Then, is, does this report contain or will future edition contain uh, examples of the most significant innovations of the year, of the past five years, of the past 10 years, because one thing is to discuss innovation in statistics, and another thing is to see one with one's own eyes and touch with one's own finger to know what all this talks about. So it is very difficult probably to know what were the most significant innovation in the computer industry in the past 20 years, but I am sure that even if we don't know which one, there are a lot of statistics about that. So this uh, I would like to clarify. Thank you. Yes, just to add to the, the point made by Sumitra, uh, the, uh, the reason why so much attention is brought to the efficiency ratio is that it allows us to highlight the performance of countries who have very little input, okay, including some of the poorest countries, which have identified ways in which innovation can help their own growth and development strategies. Uh, it's also important to keep in mind that one of the very, very initial purposes of GII was to insist on the fact that we cannot reduce innovation to technological innovation. There is social innovation, there is business model innovation, there are all sorts of other ways in which innovation can be fostered. So this efficiency ratio tracks not only the ability of poorer countries to actually identify innovation as a way to foster development, but it also encompasses all these dimensions of innovation. Tom Miles from Reuters. I wanted to ask you a couple of questions, if I may. The first one is about uh, sort of um, the, the, up, the, the gainers and losers in the rankings. I've noticed there are quite a lot of Latin American countries going up the rankings, and uh, a couple of um, Arabian Gulf countries, Bahrain and Oman, seem to have kind of um, really had a, a bad year. And I don't know whether that matters or if that's part of a trend or if, if there's anything you want to comment on about that. And the second question is about the, uh, the divide. Um, this idea that the same 25 countries are, same, are still uh, in the, the top 25 as well there last year, it seems to kind of reinforce perhaps what we already know, which is rich countries are better at innovating and creating jobs for innovation. And um, I just wondered, uh, you know, for all the sort of um, um, Arab Spring and economic rebalancing and um, uh, supposed um, uh, slowdown in, in Europe and... and um, uh, growth we're seeing in other parts of the world. Basically, the, the global um, relative positions are not changing at all. I uh, wondered if you see any message in there or any significance in the future. Is there a chance of some country breaking into the, the top ranks and staying there? Um, you know, maybe obviously China or India, uh, the ones that people have got an eye on. Thanks very much. Well, let me make some initial comments and Bruno will add to it. So if you look at Latin America as a region, you will see an increased focus on innovation, innovation policies in many countries in the region. So what is happening in Latin America, where be it Brazil, be it Colombia, be it many <clears throat> other countries in the region, you see there's a renewed focus to build on the momentum that they have gained in recent years through a variety of different favorable economic conditions and also good decisions made in various aspects of the institutional frameworks in these countries. 
So I think there's a positive momentum driving Latin America, and that is showing up in some of the rankings out there. Now, in terms of the Middle East, I will let Bruno comment on that. But these rankings give a sense of how different nations and different regions evolve over time. So sometimes it is difficult to see precise big jumps among the top leaders from year to year. But if you look at the trends, you do see trends which are quite interesting. So in the top 25, for example, you see Israel moving up quite steadily and quite rapidly year to year. And that's once again one example of how one country has made progress. You see also the US has moved back in the top five, and that's also a significant improvement in terms of the US ranking in recent years. Yes, the, uh, regarding the, uh, the three points, the uh, changes in rankings, uh, the specific issue uh, regarding Europe, for instance, and the ability of any country in the near future to break out of where they are and into the, the top. Um, very, uh, very uh, briefly, uh, and it applies to Middle Eastern countries as to other parts of the, uh, of the world. Um, we have a, a worldwide index, 142 countries. There is a crowding towards the middle, starting with number 30 up to number 70 or so. Uh, any very small variation in the index can lead to upswings and downswings in the rankings. So we should not be fascinated by these moves from one year to another. We have, as Sumitra said, look at the longer term and the time, time series. Uh, this being said, there are indicators of changes in policies, investment made, that translate into, into results. And these are the interesting stories. The, um, regarding uh, the, uh, the fact that the, the rich countries remain on top, it is uh, an undeniable uh, finding, okay, and not a surprising one, that indeed innovation performance is highly correlated to income per capita. The rich countries do better, okay? Let's not hide ourselves behind our pinky finger. Th this is the fact. The good side of the story is that this hierarchy is being challenged. We've seen countries, middle income countries, moving up very quickly. What we see, however, um, is that the, uh, there seems to be uh, a qualitative barrier, and this is why we've given additional emphasis this year on the output side of the model to quali quality elements. Uh, it seems that there's a number of elements that have to do with the creation of a good ecosystem, and I would say even a good social eco ecosystem around innovation. It's about entrepreneurship, it's about risk-taking, it's about respect for failure, it's about interdisciplinarity, it's about openness, which are very difficult to quantify. And these are probably, it's at least one of our hypotheses, one of the reasons why we see this sticky uh, rankings uh, behind the, the top 25 and, and the rest. So there's no reason why this will not be modified in the coming years. An important step is that people, people become aware, policy be, uh, makers become aware of what, where the challenge is. And on the last point about the uh, why uh, what we see in Europe, for instance, okay, big crisis. What we see is that investment in R and D and innovation have been maintained. So that says that somewhere there is a recognition by governments that innovation can play a counter-cyclical role. Uh, we designed that last year in last year's report with the name of hysteresis, saying that the worst thing that can happen to innovation investment is a stop and go policy. It becomes very, very difficult to rebuild an ecosystem if you stop investing at some point in, in R&D. And what we've seen in Europe, in other parts of the world, in the US, uh, for instance, is that not only this investment has been maintained, but it has increased in a number of cases. At the, uh, at the risk of repetition, let me just uh, make a quick comment also. Uh, I'd like to emphasize what uh, Sumitra has said, that there is, I think, a much greater consciousness around the world of the importance of innovation in economic strategy and you see that whether it is in Indonesia which has recently established a National Innovation Council or India which has a National Innovation Council, the decade of innovation and so on. You see it repeatedly across the world and that's very important and the second thing I'd like to say in this regard is that of course when you look at all of the inputs that go into this index then you see that this is not something that you can just pick up and change uh, as far as your government is concerned or your country is concerned overnight. It's a 
very gradual movement which uh, requires a, a very much a horizontal, broad-based approach covering everything in the whole spectrum of knowledge creation from your educational uh, system in the passage of knowledge from one generation to another to the creation of new knowledge uh, and the institutions and financial institutions and markets to support that. So it's, 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 it requires a, a, you know, a medium-term effort at least in order to change positions. Just a small follow-up. I'm wondering if you think that the world has got the uh, sort of economic governance architecture to handle a lot more innovation, because a lot of the rich countries are, you know, putting money into this because they know that they can milk it, for want of a better word. I mean, they can take advantage of it in the future. But uh, a lot of countries, um, I guess, if they suddenly start innovating, they don't have the capacity, they don't have the ability. Um, so maybe it's not, a, you know, it wouldn't be a good thing if the whole world started innovating because it would be getting ahead of the game. Do you think something needs to be done before innovation spreads more? Right. Well, let me, so it's a very interesting question you asked, but let me just give you a flavor. So there is, there are multiple aspects to innovation. And of course, the economic side is one very important aspect in terms of end outcome. But let's not also forget why countries are investing in innovation, because innovation is also about inspiring people. And if you look around the excitement, the softer cultural aspects that Bruno referred to earlier, especially you focus on young people today, and we know that young people in many countries, including in Europe, have a challenge today in terms of finding jobs, in terms of finding the right career possibilities, innovation in terms of either creating their own companies, innovation either in trying to you know, create some new possibilities for their own future uh, futures is a very important way of inspiring and motivating and creating the right kind of societal conditions. So I think there's a very important social benefit that is also associated with innovation which we should not underemphasize. Yes, and if I, if I may on the same uh, uh, note, uh, stress the fact that the world today is significantly different from what it was 20 years ago. Uh, the hierarchy between the more advanced country and the less advanced countries is, is being challenged by many elements. One of them is information technology. Uh, we have global networks. Uh, you may have noticed, and it should not be a surprise, that we have two new sponsors uh, joining GII this year, who are Huawei and Du, and it's no surprise that they come from that world, the world of IT and telecommunications. Uh, it's often said that Internet has been the biggest revolution uh, over the last 20 years. I, I would argue that this is not true. The biggest revolution for the majority of mankind has been mobile telephony. Uh, and what we are seeing now with the advent of broadband is a convergence of the internet revolution and the mobile revolution. And in terms of innovation, in terms of what this can do, especially for younger generations, in terms of availability of knowledge, sharing of knowledge, interfacing of ideas, is, is just tremendous. We can't just imagine all the possibilities that this will yield on the front of innovation. Hi, uh, my name is Masaki Kondo, GG Press Japanese news, news Agency. Just, um, I'm curious, can you make a projection of the ranking, let's say in five years later or 10 years later, by looking at the current trend? I mean, I understand this is a six editions. Um, did you expect Switzerland, uh, this year Switzerland was ex um, ranked n uh, number one. Did you expect this situation happened back in six years ago. Thank you. Well, so far we are not necessarily in the business of predicting. So, you know, it's an interesting question in terms of how much can we extrapolate from the data, data, data that we have today about the future. Today we are much more focused on trying to understand the multifaceted phenomenon of innovation and trying to understand how can we better measure it such that governments and the right <clears throat> decision makers in public and private you know, sectors can guide the decision making based on the kind of thinking that we are proposing in this innovation framework. But having said this, your suggestion is a very interesting one for 
hypothetical you know, analysis of what the future might look like. We, we don't do these predictions right now, but in terms of found internal analysis, it's an exploration <coughs> avenue to be considered. Uh, definitely, uh, and you also mentioned that this is the sixth year of GII, and once you pass the, the critical stage of five years, you start to have time series you can also look at. So the ability to try and understand what the future could look like is also very much linked to the fact that we have already a certain period of time where we see things happening. And when we look at what has happened so far, we see that it's full of surprises. Uh, we've seen swings in ranking, so we know, we hope, that the future will be full of surprises. So uh, predicting is a very difficult thing to do, especially when it applies to the future, as somebody said. Uh, the, uh, we also must remember that one of the messages that GII delivers is that innovation is not an equation. It is not about chemistry where you know what you put this ingredient, you mix it at that temperature, and this is the result you're going to obtain. Uh, innovation is much closer to alchemy. There is a magical phenomenon happening. There's creativity. There are young people coming with ideas that the previous generation had not thought of. So we need to factor that in. And when we factor that in, again, the answer is the future will be full of surprises. Um, yes, Gunilla von Hall, uh, Swedish, Svenska Dagbladet. I have a question on the Nordic countries, because I can see all the five Nordic countries here are the very, among the 15, the top, I think. And do you have an explanation why this is? Are the similarities in, in the policies in our societies that make us make these good places? So do you have an uh, analysis of this? Thank you. I'd like to to make one quick comment and then I'll leave the experts to give you a better answer. None of them has resources. Uh, if you look at the top 10 countries, it's very interesting. You know, Switzerland, lakes and mountains, Sweden, UK, Netherlands, US is perhaps an exception, uh, Finland, Hong Kong, Singapore, Denmark, Ireland, they're all countries without natural resources and that's not an accident, I think. Yes, the, uh, the Nordic group is obviously a fascinating group for all of us uh, because they, they are the good students. Okay? They sit on the front row and they get the good marks. Um, what is interesting is that there are common points, and typically the one that Francis just mentioned is critically important, absence of resources. Um, even if Norway uh, right now is enjoying a good oil ride, uh, but it's critically where they started from. Um, yet, there are separate stories. That is, if we take the case of Finland, for instance, uh, Finland saw suddenly 75% of their external trade collapse with that of the Soviet Union. Uh, it created Nokia, it created a number of other in incentives. Um, Denmark uh, had other challenges, etc. So they are within the same family, uh, different stories. One thing that remains uh, across Nordic countries is the high importance and value granted to education. This is a common point which we see all across Nordic countries. Investment in younger generation is critically important in terms of generating innovation. I just have a technical uh, question, and it's, it's well in the uh, country pages in, under uh, creative outputs. You have um, abbreviations like uh, BN and PPPS. Could you just tell me what this means? It's 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 a it's a ratio between um, between patents, for example, and uh, and the GDP. I imagine, but uh, it's. Uh, Every page on the countries, each country uh, you have on creative outputs or um, also on the knowledge and technology outputs. You have a domestic resident patents and then you have a um, AP, which I think is applications, but then a slash BN, which I don't know, and then PPPS. The BN stands for billion. For what billion? Okay. And the PPP stands for purchasing power parity. Sorry? Purchasing power parity. All right, okay, yes. Okay. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Hi, so 
Sorry, uh, Nina Larson, AFP. I was just wondering if you could say, um, in line with what you said about the Nordic countries, what it is about Switzerland uh, besides the lack of uh, na uh, natural resources that makes it stand at the top, and also what the U.S. has done to come back. The, we, we often tend to include uh, Switzerland in the Nordics uh, for so many reasons, uh, which is a geographical <laughs> mistake, but uh, economically there's lots of similarities. Um, there's something quite uh, specific about Switzerland and Sweden. These are the two countries who have a top uh, record on all pillars of GII. So it's not just the fact that you are at the top, it's the fact that you are balanced, there's no weakness. These are the two countries for which we have this spectacular result. Yeah, let me just make a comment out there. You know, it, being at the top doesn't necessarily mean that you're perfect. It just means in relative terms, you're doing much better than others. So the rankings are relative rankings. It's very important to keep it in mind. Now about the US, clearly, you know, what we are seeing in America also is a renewed focus on trying to drive innovation as a national policy. President Obama has made that a focus of his efforts. The US has a number of strong foundations on which to build, be it in tertiary education, be it in technology and technology outputs, or even in the market sophistication or the business sophistication where it does extremely well on both market sophistication and business sophistication is ranked number two. But what you're seeing today in the US is examples in which local systems and local environments are pushing innovation very heavily. I take one example in which we are involved at Cornell very deeply in, which is the Cornell Tech project in New York, where Mayor Bloomberg is trying to drive innovation into the heart of New York City's economy. And as part of the push, he had a major competition, invited worldwide universities compete. Cornell was very fortunate to win that competition and now Cornell is involved in setting up a technology innovation ecosystem in New York City in collaboration with the private sector, in collaboration with the city government, and also very important in collaboration with a foreign partner university, which is Technion in this case. So you see this effort at trying to drive innovation even in some of the most mature parts of the U.S. geographically and from an economic point of view. And that, I think, is very telling of the U.S. drive on innovation today. Yeah, Xin from China's National Television. Uh, first of all, I didn't hear exactly what you say about the similarity between Sweden and Switzerland. I didn't understand that if you would uh, repeat that very briefly. Secondly, there are three uh, index climbers, Uganda, Costa Rica, Bolivia, each climbing about 20 places. That's really remarkable. What are the factors in your mind? And for a gigantic country like China, what does China have to do now so that it can maybe achieve similar result in the future. Thank you. Thank you. I will let me try and answer the point about Latin America. Uh, just very quickly on the first one, uh, what is remarkable about Switzerland and Sweden is that these are the only two countries in the world who are in the top 25 for every single pillar of GII. So it's a very balanced uh, performance. Um, regarding, regarding China, we, uh, we see two things uh, which have to do with the uh, middle income countries and BRICS, uh, which is hitting this invisible wall whereby building the ecosystem is becoming critically important, what we discussed uh, earlier. In the case of China, and it, apply, it applies to other very big countries, we also realize that using national aggregated data tells only a little part of the picture. Uh, we wish we had data at the, the province and municipalities level because we have reasons to suspect that innovation performance will be different in different parts of large countries. Uh, and again, it does not apply only to China, but this might be an area for research that maybe we can stimulate in the country with Chinese universities to actually take the GI methodology and bring it to province and municipalities level. 
Let me just add a few words on China, and then I'll talk about Costa Rica. You know, we are very pleased that uh, we have, of course, an advisory board, Professor Chen from Peking University, and also Huawei, which is the company that grew out of China into a global organization as part of Knowledge Partner. <coughs> and China is today ranked 35th, but what is interesting is that it is ranked third amongst the upper middle income countries. And China entered into the group of upper middle income countries only about three years ago. Before that, it was a lower middle income country categorized as such. So even though it shifted in income category in the last three years, it is today ranked third just after Malaysia and Latvia in that group. So it's very creditable performance. If you look at some of the quality indicators that Bruno mentioned, we are trying to increasingly talk about the quality of innovation as part of a metrics. Three examples. If you look at the QS top three universities in the country ranking, China is at position number ninth. If you look at the high tech and medium tech exports, China is ranked 16th in the world. If you look at the citation and documents, China is ranked 17th in the world. So I think China has extremely strong performance and clearly the directional trends are that it's moving the right direction. But as Bruno mentioned, whether and how quickly will it break into the top 25 remains to be seen. Now the question about Costa Rica, first of all, some of the big shifts in rankings are subject to sometimes small movements. As I mentioned earlier, sometimes there is a crowding of scores and so small shifts can result in sometimes small changes in scores can result in big shifts. But Costa Rica is an interesting example because that's a country that has always had a very strong foundation education, always been very open to investments. Intel, as many of us know, made a huge investment in Costa Rica. And last year, one of uh, Daniela Benavente, who is the lead researcher of the Global Innovation Index and a wonderful effort in terms of helping her produce this, she went on a mission to Costa Rica and she had a discussion with the government and when asked which countries do they compare themselves against, Costa Rican officials said they choose Malaysia and Ireland as some of their comparative benchmarks. So you see that this is a country that is constantly trying to achieve at a different level and I think that's something which are reasons why Costa Rica is moving and doing well in this ranking. If you look at some of the pillars in knowledge absorption, Costa Rica is ranked number ninth. If you look at knowledge diffusion, Costa Rica is ranked number eight. If you look at high-tech exports, Costa Rica is ranked number fifth. If you look at communication info from information services exports, Costa Rica is ranked number eight. So once again, some very strong performance that drives the movement of Costa Rica. We have time perhaps for one last question because we have to be in the ECOSOC high level segment for the formal launch with the Secretary General of the United Nations. Thank you. Which are all welcome to join. Ishiguro of Yomiri Shimbun. I think you might have explained it already, but I missed it. So let me ask it. Switzerland is keeping the number one position consecutively how many years? And secondly, in case of Singapore, it lost five positions. Is there a particular reason for that? Yes, yeah, so Switzerland, we, we've covered, again, very balanced, steady uh, performance on all, uh, all pillars. Uh, in the case of, uh, of Singapore, we see uh, Singapore still very high on the input side among the top performers in the world, and the performance this year has been affected on the, mostly on the output side, which is where we have introduced a number of new variables. So these are clearly areas in which uh, Singapore has not been performing as well as in other variables. Uh, so this does not uh, indicate any, uh, any trend for the future. We have reasons to think that uh, indeed we are going to see uh, uh, Singapore getting back up uh, the rankings on the, on the output side. Uh, but again, uh, this has been one of the main reasons behind the, the differences between 2012 and 2013. And, and Switzerland is keeping the number one position this year, how many years consecutively? Uh, two years. Yeah, it's been the second year the Switzerland is number one. Yeah, third, third report in which it's reported, yes. I, I'm told that ECOSOC is running a bit late, so we do have time for maybe 
One more question. Okay. You, Boris? There is a whole chapter on the Arab world, and the Arab world was traditionally known for high literary innovation and low industrial innovation. So what does, what are your findings? And uh, considering the new hubs in the Arab world, does that mean that good industrial innovation requires low democracy and low literature? Yeah, it, it's always uh, delicate to aggregate all countries in one group uh, to uh, infer judgments on what works, what doesn't work. Uh, there is a high degree of variety uh, in the Arab world. There are different uh, paths of development. There are different uh, histories, different culture. What we see, however, is that some of the uh, fastest moving uh, countries uh, in the region uh, have been indeed countries which have a high degree of openness. That is, these are countries in which the uh, ability to attract talent, uh, to attract technology, to attract uh, financing when it's not available uh, locally has been uh, critically important to the success. What we see also is in the light of latest uh, events on the uh, political and social fronts is that sometimes the, the performance has been more difficult to track. There are some countries in which we have not been able to collect the data that we wanted. Uh, in others, we see a relatively steady performance. That is, whatever the, uh, the state of the evolution on the political and social front, we see that policies related to innovation, investment, where the private sector uh, is able to do, etc., have remained on, on the course we had seen, we had seen before. Uh, we have also uh, very good examples uh, in countries like Tunisia and Morocco, where follow different paths, uh, where the, the quality of high-level education, especially in engineering school, etc., continues to translate into high power to innovate in the companies of those countries.